I'm Dr. Dan Von Allman, a Surgeon-in-Chief at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and I'm going to review the essentials of neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma is the most common extracranial solid tumor in children, with the majority occurring in children less than a year old. How do these children typically present? In the younger patients, they're oftentimes um, picked up either prenatally on ultrasound or in uh, younger kids, say two-year-old or three-year-old, it might be picked up as a solid abdominal mass. Occasionally, when they have metastatic disease, they'll present with either bony pain or potentially neurologic symptoms from cord compression. If a child presents with an abdominal mass, how would you work them up? So oftentimes when a child presents to the emergency room, they may get an ultrasound, which will demonstrate a solid uh, mass in the abdomen. Those kids then will get a laboratory workup. And as part of the differential diagnosis, when you consider neuroblastoma, it's important to get uh, catecholamines, either urine or serum catecholamines, as one of the most diagnostic laboratory tests that we use. Most kids would then get a cross-sectional imaging study, either a CT scan or an MRI. If those studies uh, suggest a neuroblastoma that is either a central abdominal mass or adrenal mass uh, rather than, for example, a, a kidney mass, then the next test would be a nuclear medicine study, typically an MIBG study. The MIBG study is helpful for confirming the diagnosis of neuroblastoma and also can demonstrate a metastatic disease. Uh, an MIBG is not 100% accurate. About 10% of neuroblastomas are MIBG negative. Some centers, including ours, would get a PET scan uh, looking for, uh, again, tumor uptake as well as potential metastatic disease. How do you risk stratify patients with neuroblastoma? So based on the most recent iteration of the neuroblastoma staging system, the INRGSS, it is possible to assign a stage before any in invasive procedure is performed. So tumors that are localized are categorized as L1. If they're localized but have what are called image-defined risk factors, that is they may encase nerves or vessels and there's a whole long list of image-defined risk factors for each body cavity, then they would be L2. If they have metastatic disease, they're M. And then there's the special category of MS for children that are less than 18 months of age who have uh, metastases to either the bone marrow or the skin. A child presents with a right-sided adrenal mass with no evidence of metastasis. What are your next steps? So that child is potentially could be treated with primary resection of the mass. Uh, if there's no evidence of other tumor, uh, the mass looks resectable, I would treat that patient with a laparotomy and resection. Some people would approach that with laparoscopy depending on the size of the tumor. What if you have a patient with a large adrenal mass involving the central vasculature? Typically, those are central abdominal types of tumors that encase the aorta, the cava, other major vasculature. And in that case, all you really want is tissue for diagnosis. And that can be obtained uh, either through open biopsy, laparoscopic biopsy, or even core needle biopsies done by an interventional radiologist. And what you're looking for in the biopsy results are to get the biologic risk uh, determinants out of the uh, tissue. The most important of those is the NMIC status. You also want to look for 1P and 11Q deletions, but the most important thing you want to know is NMIC status along with the Shimada histology. So that will tell you whether what risk category the patient falls into, and they can be either uh, very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. It's divided about 50-50 between the low risk categories and the high risk category, and then a smaller percentage are intermediate risk. NMIC and, and age greater than 18 months are the most important prognostic determinants for neuroblastoma. In patients with high risk tumor, they receive aggressive chemotherapy, including peripheral uh, stem cell transplant times two, 
as well as aggressive surgery with the goal of a greater than 90% resection of the tumor, uh, followed by radiation, immunotherapy after the chemotherapy, and potentially retinoic acid therapy. So very aggressive therapy for the high-risk group. So intermediate risk tumors get varying cycles of chemotherapy based on the biologic risk factors that they have. In terms of surgery, the goal at the time of debulking or resecting the primary tumor is to achieve at least a 50% response. And that is from the initial volume of the primary tumor. So the combination of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgical resection should achieve a greater than 50% reduction in the primary tumor size. The low risk group, depending on the actual age of the patient and how it's diagnosed, could potentially be followed simply with observation. Jed Nocturn led a study through the children's oncology group looking at patients less than six months of age with either a prenatally diagnosed or shortly postnatally diagnosed localized mass. Those patients can be observed with the expectation that the vast majority of them will avoid any type of surgical procedure. How would your care plan change if your patient had metastasis? So typically those patients would receive four or five cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then be reassessed. If the tumor is responding and specifically if the metastatic disease is responding, then one would attack the primary tumor site with a resection and many including myself, would advocate for attempting a greater than 90% resection. If the metastatic disease is progressing, then the surgery is not indicated. And your final scenario, what if our patient has MS disease? MS disease is specifically for patients who have a primary site with metastatic disease to the liver, the skin, or the bone marrow, specifically not bone, not cortical bone, uh, and is less than 18 months of age. In those patients, simple observation can be the treatment path. If they progress or they end up with respiratory issues because of an enlarging liver mass or something like that, then you might elect to treat them uh, because of the complication of the size of the tumor, but the tumor itself usually does not have to be treated. Now that we've reviewed the essentials of neuroblastoma, What would you say are the key clinical takeaways? We're not going to leave you hanging. Here are some of our clinical takeaways that we hope you can apply to your practice. Neuroblastoma is the most common extracranial solid tumor in children. It often presents with an abdominal mass. Workup involves abdominal ultrasound, blood work, MIBG scan, and cross-sectional imaging. Get tissue through open, laparoscopic, or core needle biopsy. Post-biopsy staging is stratified into very low, low, intermediate, and high risk. NMIC amplification and age greater than 18 months are poor prognostic factors. And finally, treatment is based on risk. Low risk, operate or observe, age depending. Intermediate risk, chemotherapy, and a more limited surgical resection. High risk, neoadjuvant chemo, surgery, radiation, peripheral stem cell transplant, and immunotherapy. There you have it, folks, our first video cast on neuroblastoma. Let us know what you think, what you liked, what you didn't, what worked for you, or what you would like to see. We really appreciate all of your input. This video cast was created and edited by Ray Hankey, Zach Korb, Daniel Von Allman, Todd Ponsky, and the rest of the State Current crew. Remember, knowledge should be free.